we've nothing to disclose. I'm just going to roll through the first few slides. Uh, why is someone even referred to a psychiatrist? Usually it's because of behaviors, concerns about aggression, property destruction, or mood changes, withdrawal, crying, a loss of interest in activities that someone previously really enjoyed, change in sleep patterns. And I notice that many of the referrals that we receive, the families will say, we cannot find a psychiatrist or a local mental community health clinic will not see our family member because they're nonverbal. And I realize that doesn't make sense. I mean, would a pediatrician ever say, oh, I won't see your infant, he's nonverbal? <laughs> would a neurologist say to um, someone, well, you had a stroke, you're aphasic, you can't speak, forget it, I really can't see you. That doesn't make any sense. And so as mental health workers, of course we can evaluate people whether or not they can communicate through spoken language. I want to give a few examples of people that I've recently um, seen or were referred to me for mental health assessments. And I, we don't have a ton of time. Rich said don't read all of them, but I'm just going to give you a little snapshot. AC is a 16-year-old nonverbal teenager with autism, intellectual disability, ADHD, long history of aggression, impulsivity, hyperactivity with a recent dramatic off-the-charts escalation and violence necessitating two-to-one staffing at school and at home. HC, a 36-year-old man, very limited verbal skills, Down syndrome, intellectual disability, previously nonviolent, very active participant in his adult day program. Now he's attacked his mother, eloped from his adult day program, ran into traffic. He's been suspended from his program. He's moving furniture around the house, blocking people from leaving or entering like the living room or wherever the family's gathered. SD, a 42-year-old woman, Down syndrome, limited verbal skills, picking up forks, threatening to stab her housemate whenever their longtime caregiver of 13 years turns her back. And she's also not able to follow directions. She's repeating questions, and she can't do chores that she used to do and enjoy. AE, a 14-year-old verbal boy with autism, ADHD, who became wildly aggressive and agitated when treated with stimulants, SSRIs. He's increasingly violent to himself and his mom and sister. He's picked up knives, held them to his throat, and threatened to stab himself. I'm going to just skip the other two. Straightforward, right? Um, yeah, we can do this, and um, join me in Ukiah on Thursday where I see eight people just like this in a typical clinic. So welcome to the regional center. So where to begin? Well, first of all, remember, when we do an assessment of someone who's verbal or nonverbal, it's the same assessment. A person is a person. The difference is if someone is nonverbal, we do rely more heavily on a family member, a care provider. We need more collateral information. Um, we all already know this, but just because someone's nonverbal doesn't mean they don't understand us. And of course, we have to be open to alternative ways of communicating. Sometimes people are typing or writing or whispering to a, care, a, a loved one or care provider. Even if they're not going to verbally speak to me, they are communicating in some way. So prior to even doing an assessment, we gather as much information as possible because we want to be, we want to use our time as effectively as possible. So I'm not walking in cold. I review our questionnaire that I send that gets completed and returned. I want information from school if it's a student. So I want the IEP. 
I send the classroom teacher a Connors behavior rating scale because I want to know this child's current classroom behavior. Any relevant medical information, we want labs. There's been psychoeducational testing at the school, which is universally excellent, honestly, if they're passed. Um, mental health assessments. So we gather that and review it. Um, is there, a, ah, an inch and a half thick, I measured it. So it can take a while to review this information before we have the appointment. Now, where do we even meet? It's, it seems logical we meet in an office. Well, let me tell you, I have been seeing one gentleman, a 26-year-old at the North Bay Regional Center in Santa Rosa in the parking lot for eight years. Why? He won't leave the car. And initially, mom would pull up in a minivan, he'd be way in the back because he would grab her arm when driving, and it was so dangerous. Over the past eight years, I'm happy to say, with gaining trust from mom, he re-entered school, ABA therapy, and over the years, now she pulls up in a pickup truck, and he's sitting next to her, and he leans across and reaches his hand out the window, and we hold hands during our appointments. Lest you think it's all warm and cuddly, once I convince mom and, and this young man to come in, come into the office. Well, he did come in. The problem was we couldn't get him out of the regional center. He got into the elevator. If, if any of you have ever been to the Santa Rosa, uh, North Bay Regional Center, there is an elevator, and that was a problem. But luckily, eventually, without having to call the police, we were able to get him out. But it was challenging. Uh, I also have met with people in the waiting room. So we meet people where they need to get met. With the patient and the family's permission, we invite other people into the room. This is not like psychoanalytic therapy. I need information from other people. So we'll invite the behaviorists if there's one on board. We will invite teachers. We invite respite workers. It's a team approach. The first thing we have to do, obviously, is establish some kind of rapport, gain trust, so people know that we want to help them. Then we need to identify target symptoms. Why are you here today? And if it's aggression or property destruction, what are the triggers? How frequently does it happen? What's the duration of the outburst? Where does it occur? It's very significant if we're only seeing behavioral issues at school, but everything's at, ho at home is fine, or vice versa. Changes in mood, crying, loss of interest, not making expected gains at school, all of those things, we're just trying to, inter trying to figure out why are you here? How can we help you today? Very important to review past psychiatric history in depth. So we want to know, um, have there been past treatments? And if so, what were they? I saw a kid just the other day, actually the, the boy with that big stack of papers who had had chelation therapy, um, which is, as we just learned, very dangerous among many other treatments. But we want to know what was tried, what didn't work. Has this person been a victim of um, sexual abuse, physical abuse? Have they witnessed domestic violence, trauma, home, homelessness? or a car accident, we want to know if there have been past psychiatric hospitalizations, depressive symptoms, manic symptoms. I saw a man um, who I've been seeing for many years. I remember when I first saw him, 46-year-old man with cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, and bipolar disorder. When I first saw him, the concern was what is going on once a month? He is so agitated and so aggressive. In getting a history, about once a month, he had severe fecal impaction. He could easily go five days without a bowel movement, and yeah, he would get uncomfortable. The problem was, his, of course, his constipation regimen was not working, um, but 
they, what was written in the orders was a rectal suppository as a rescue medicine. Staff, he would get so agitated, they would call elderly mom who would drive over an hour to come to his home to give him a suppository. It turns out in getting a history, he had been sexually molested, he'd been raped by a care provider when he was a teenager. So giving him this suppository was traumatizing him every single month. So obviously the intervention was aggressively treating the constipation with his primary care provider and his gastroenterologist and switching um, his rescue medicine to oral medicine rather than a rectal suppository and adding the magic ingredient prune juice, six ounces a day. Oh my God, it's amazing. Um, medical history, really important and people, you know, sometimes get a little confused. Aren't you a psychiatrist? Why are you asking so much medical information? Well, as you know, so many of our folks cannot tell us if they're in pain or are hyposensitive to pain. They have this very high pain tolerance. So if they're expressing pain, you know it's completely out of control. So we do get a neuro history, a GI history, GU, sleep, dental, substance abuse. I want to give a little example about GI history. Um, I saw a boy, um, seven-year-old, in Eureka at the regional center office who was on one of those safety harnesses, let's just say leash, absolutely wild. Um, if he was not on that safety harness, I don't know what would have happened. Um, not making any gains academically at school, not toilet trained, such involved, excellent parents, excellent special education, ABA therapy, not making any gains, and um, agitated, irritable, aggressive. He also engaged in pica. So he was one of those boys where, you know, the shopping carts, he would lick and put his mouth on it, um, eat things from the ground, pull things out of the garbage and eat them. And in asking a GI history, because when I see people with pica, I do ask about GI stuff. Uh, this boy had loose stools all day long, week in, month out, and it was really difficult because he's not toilet trained. So at school and at home, they were dealing with diarrhea chronically. I asked the pediatrician, please do a stool culture. It took three months to get it. But when it was finally done, it was positive for Campylobacter and Enteropathic E. coli. They treated the boy and the diarrhea went away and his behavior got better. He's still autistic and intellectually delayed, but at least the family was not dealing with that on top of everything else. We just heard such an amazing presentation from Dr. Wong. I've learned so much from Alan Wong. Thank you, Alan. Um, I saw a boy also in Eureka. He was, um, let's see, I think I mentioned him before, 14, teenager, so aggressive and so agitated. He was so agitated and aggressive that despite having two behavioral aids, I could not see him in an office. I saw him just off the waiting room. There's a big, like a conference room with glass walls and a door. He was constantly pacing back and forth, banging his head against the wall, grabbing objects and throwing them. It was mayhem in that room. Dad, very dejected, very depressed, just sitting um, overwhelmed. Mom, a nurse, had left the family, the marriage. Dad was on his own, worked at PG&E. And every question I would ask Dad, um, he would say, oh, I don't know. Mom would know that. I don't know. Meanwhile, there's a tornado going on. At one moment in this assessment, um, the boy came over to dad um, and grabbed dad's hand and stuck dad's finger in the back of the boy's mouth. And honestly, time stood still. I just thought, uh-oh, he's going to bite dad's 
finger off right in front of my eyes. Is there someone in Eureka that can put a finger back on? It was just absolutely horrifying. Dad is abs making no expression. It was like this. While this out of control boy sticks his finger in his mouth, but he didn't bite his finger off. He took his hand out of the mouth and then went back to banging his head and throwing things. I asked dad, has he done that before? Yes. Is he always putting your finger in the same place in his mouth? Yes. When's the last time he's seen a dentist? I don't know. Mom would know. I said, what's her cell number? We're calling her. And he said, oh, you know, if I call, she won't answer. I said, well, I have a cell phone. Let's call her. I called her. She answered. I explained the scenario. I asked, when's the last time he's seen a dentist? Oh, it's been five years at least. He won't cooperate with a dentist. Well, I told you both parents had jobs. They had private dental insurance. And within a week, that boy was seen at St. Joe's for hospital dentistry. He had a giant dental abscess, which they treated. And his behavior improved. So that's why we're asking so much medical history. Substance abuse. I ask, we always ask about alcohol, drugs, and often families, providers will say, oh, you know, no, of course not, of course not. Well, I saw a woman recently, um, Crescent City, a woman um, 42, intellectual disability. She was referred because, you know, she's irritable, she's angry, she's not going to day programs, she's just not doing much of anything. And in getting a history, she told me she drinks an entire bottle of wine, but only one bottle Friday, one bottle Saturday, one bottle Sunday, and then otherwise just drinks rum, even though it makes her vomit. Well, I mean, no one knew this woman is, is drinking, and obviously women are at greater risk of cirrhosis. So anyway, we always ask about substances. Medication, we really need to know what is your current medication. What's written down in the chart is not always what they're actually taking. Compliance, a huge issue. So many people mean well, they want their child or young adult to be as independent as possible, so they let them be in charge of their medication. Well, sometimes that leads to medication non-compliance, um, just because the person forgets or can't keep track, and so we don't really even know what's going on unless we ask specifically what medicine is actually being consumed, what potential side effects could be happening, and past medications tried and failed. Really important. Pregnancy and developmental history, I think it's explanatory. Exposures in utero, drugs, alcohol is going to have a significant impact. We want to know about self-care skills, toileting, hygiene, toothbrushing, family history. Now, it's very interesting to me when we ask about family history and the answer is nothing. Like, really? Nothing? There's no family history on both sides of any mental illness, emotional issue, substance abuse, cancer, hypertension. I mean, that's pretty unusual. Recently, I did see a boy, 14, um, at the North Bay Regional Center in, in Santa Rosa. Um, he was extremely aggressive, and he's the one who picked up knives and held them to his throat on three occasions and threatened to kill himself or someone else. Well, mom had told me there was absolutely no family history. And getting a little more family history, or at least trying to gain some trust, um, I asked her, is there anyone else who has anger or temper issues in the family? And she proceeded to tell me that she was recently divorced, that during pregnancy, right after the marriage, she experienced um, domestic violence. It went on during her pregnancy, and uh, both kids had witnessed domestic violence and were the victims of physical abuse. So this boy had a lot of modeling for aggression. She also told me, well, 
it turns out my brother, he used to use drugs. And they say, he's in Saudi Arabia, so I don't know everything about the name of his illness or his medicines. They say it's because he did drugs, but he hears voices, he's extremely aggressive, the medicines help, but about every month or every couple months, he doesn't sleep, he talks nonstop, and he gets super, super aggressive. And turns out my aunt and my cousin, it's the same thing. But they told my aunt it's because she was abused by her husband. That's why she behaves this way. Well, it turns out this boy had been given stimulants and SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and he had gotten wildly manic. He would not sleep, more aggressive, nonstop talking. So it turns out by getting the family history of what sounds like bipolar disorder, it really helps us guide what kind of treatment intervention or medications. And when I asked her, well, have you ever told his treating psychiatrist, because I was a second opinion, they had Kaiser, about your family history, she said, no, no one's really ever asked, and the appointments are so rushed. So that's an example where family history is really important. Social history. Well, we all know we're asking for safety reasons about guns. I just want to point out, there are weapons beyond guns. I saw one boy in Napa at the North Bay Regional Center. They didn't have guns, but they had machetes. And this boy, was, they, lived on a, they live on a ranch, an adopted boy and his brother. Um, this boy has autism, his brother does not. His brother was extremely aggressive, really scary aggressive, and there were machetes lying around. Another family that I saw um, in Laytonville, they didn't have guns, but they had a samurai, samurai sword collection, and this was an extremely aggressive teenager. So anyway, just a little. The other thing that is very important is food insecurity. It doesn't happen frequently, but it happens. And twice in asking about, is there enough food at home? Or at least when I remember to ask, I've been told, no, there is not enough food. I live in Marin County. There's food insecurity in 20% of the people in Marin County, a very affluent county. That means most likely there's quite a bit of food insecurity out there. So when we're doing a mental health assessment and behaviors or mood are an issue, we really need to know, is there enough food? Of course, education history and uh, is there an adult day program? If it's an adult, um, there's this expression um, that Rich taught me, being in your right mole. Kind of, are you in your right environment? So if you're a kid going to school and there's such a stigma against special education, and I see so many kids, they're not in special education. And maybe it worked in early elementary school, but after a while, a teacher has 30 kids, and this child is getting no speech therapy, not even resource. So it's really important that we make sure there's a good fit. A lot of families don't send their folks to an adult day program because, as we've learned, they're, they're worried. They're worried, could there be abuse? Um, my, my son is nonverbal, and I'm just scared that something could happen. I wouldn't know about it. But the flip side of that is there's no, no cognitive stimulation going on, no socialization. If the person's just sitting home watching TV all day, what's going on? No vocational training. So we really do want to get a sense about what a typical day is like. A mental status exam, that's sort of in mental health, that's like our physical exam. That's where we're trying to get some better understanding of the person's cognition, mood. Are there any psychotic symptoms? Well, how do you figure out if someone might have psychotic symptoms if they're nonverbal? Well, I'll give you some examples. HC, who I mentioned before, the gentleman with Down syndrome, who 
enjoyed his day program, but that had all fallen apart. And he um, was actually attacking his mother. And this was new behavior. The family, when talking to them, also reported that even though he was minimally verbal, he seemed to be having angry conversations, but no one was there. Um, he also was the one moving furniture to prevent people from getting in or leaving rooms. And he used to love family gatherings. He didn't love them anymore. And this man with Down syndrome, unfortunately, was having most likely auditory hallucinations um, and paranoid ideation. And we know that people with Down syndrome really are at higher risk of cognitive decline. They have three copies of the amyloid precursor protein gene, which cause deposition of amyloid. Um, beta plaques, and that's what we see in people with Alzheimer's. So as many as 80% of people with Down syndrome will have cognitive decline by age 65. And it can present early, not as cognitive decline, but as psychotic symptoms, like wisps of psychosis. Um, how can we tell if there is cognitive decline? Well, that's why we need a family member or a care provider, because I'm not gonna know the person's baseline and the person may not be able to describe their baseline. But that the, the, um, the woman that I told you about or mentioned earlier, SD, the 42-year-old woman with Down syndrome, she was doing okay at her adult day program, but by the time she got home, she was repeating questions constantly. Her care provider was so worried she couldn't follow directions. She used to love to sort laundry by colors. Now she would sit in front of the laundry and just looked, look overwhelmed and confused and was no longer able to do that. And she was paranoid. And that's why when that care provider turned her back, she was picking up a fork in an attempt to stab her, her um, housemate. So these, that's just like some examples of how we assess cognitive decline if someone has an intellectual disability. It's loss of skills, loss of self-care skills. What about um, how would you get a sense if someone's depressed if they're nonverbal? Well, we're looking at them. If they look sad, if we're hearing that they're withdrawn, that they're resisting going to school, resisting going to an adult day program, not doing previous activities that they enjoyed, crying, that's kind of a tip off. Change in sleep, change in appetite, change in energy. What about anxiety? Looking scared, looking worried, not wanting to leave their room, panic attacks. Um, these are things that we certainly can ascertain during an assessment. Um, once we've done all of these various questions and observations, we are better able to develop a diagnostic formulation, impression, come up with a diagnosis, and then recommend a treatment plan, which may include medication, though that's not all of what we do. And now, take it away, Dr. Richard Goldwasser. I'm gonna talk briefly about, um, actually, DSM-5 and the diagnostic categories that are in particular highlighting some of the common areas that, uh, that we see in working with individuals with developmental disabilities, and then I'm going to talk about, about treatment and psychopharmacology. Just a breeze through the, psycho, the, the, the DSM-5, we've been talking a lot uh, the last two days about the neurodevelopmental disorders, intellectual disability, and autism. ADHD is categorized now as a, as a neurodevelopmental disorder. 
when you look at sort of broadly, about a third or so of people with, with uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, neurodevelopmental disorders, also have some degree of ADHD, which is a very treatable condition that may facilitate the, 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 the individual's ability to use uh, many of the other services that are part of the treatment plan. Uh, motor disorders, the stereotypic movement disorders, those include things like uh, people with the head banging or, or, or the, or, or the self-injurious behaviors, and tic disorders. The other development, neurodevelopmental disorders would include things like fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, the schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, you remember from, from last year there was a discussion about the genetic polymorphisms and, and that there's the, um, the, the common markers that raise the, in, the risk of autism spectrum disorders, schizophrenia as well as bipolar disorders. And as Susan said in, in uh, her cases uh, described, there is a higher frequency of mood disorders, particularly bipolar disorder, in individuals with developmental disabilities. The depressive disorders, I'm going to not listing all of them, of course, major depression and then the dysthymia, the persistent depressive disorder, premenstrual, dis premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and then the, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. They sort of created that one um, in response to the observation that many of those kids a decade ago that were diagnosed with bipolar disorder kind of outgrew it. And so they realized, okay, we need something better to describe it. And um, I don't know how I can figure and get this thing to, to work. Well, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. These are the kids that have prolonged rages, you know, half an hour or hours on end of explosive uh, um, outbursts, and in between them, predominantly irritable. Uh, um, Anxiety disorders, super, super common. And some of the common ones, the separation anxiety, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, panic. And then the, the lumpers and the splitters, they split obsessive compulsive out of anxiety disorders, uh, but there still is a lot of overlap with, with OCD. Uh, the trichotillomania, and then the excoriation, spin, skin picking disorder. Woman I saw just this last week, 63, cerebral palsy, moderate intellectual disability. In her SLS arrangement right now, there's a lot of stress, a lot of stuff going on, and surprise, surprise, she's now picked a huge hole in her arm. Um, she's been on Zoloft, we're moving that up a little bit more for her. The trauma, we've heard a lot about that, the post-traumatic stress disorder, certainly overrepresented in, in, in this population. Reactive attachment disorder, real interesting talk in, in and of itself, but kids who have been, uh, been uh, abused, neglected early in life, form disrupted early attachments, either really withdrawn and, and, and inhibited, or kids that are um, wildly disinhibited, and can certainly look like autism spectrum disorder in some respects, and particularly the kids that are exposed in utero to drugs and alcohol, and then the early abuse, trauma, neglect, that sometimes you'll actually see a mix of the ASD with the reactive attachment disorder. Dissociative disorders, the somatic, the somatic symptom, conversion disorder, just to uh, point that out. You know, that, uh, that refers to people like with, um, with non-epileptic seizures, uh, also something that's connected with or associated with, or with trauma. Uh, the feeding disorders, we heard about the pica. Uh, um, elimination disorders. Sleep-wake disorders, and we've had some excellent uh, presentations in previous years about sleep-wake disorders. You know, suffice it to say, super, super common, and, and none of us sleep you know, functions well without a good, qual good quality sleep. Uh, the sexual dysfunctions, gender dysphoria, kind of an interesting aside that the uh, um, individuals with autism spectrum disorder seem to be a, a higher proportion of folks who, who are transgender and non-binary. Uh, um, and of course, in that sort of process of growing up, the gender dysphoria is not unusual. Um, disruptive disorders, substance-related disorders, then Susan's talking about the neurocognitive disorders, particularly things like the, the, the um, neurocognitive disorders like, like Alzheimer's. I'm flying through this, you know, it's all in the syllabus. Personality disorders. The last one, medication-induced movement disorders. This refers to like tardive dyskinesia, uh, which can be associated with all of the antipsychotic medications. And now, moving into treatment. <laughs> so, 
Where do we start? Well, going back to the basics. Who else do we need on the medical team? Neurology, GI, ENT, sleep disorder specialists, dental, behavioral, psychology, both for therapy as well as for testing, speech and language, OT. So many of these folks have sensory processing differences. OT can be tremendously helpful for, for them, as well as, of course, for the motor skills. PT, special ed, most of these uh, folks really do better with an individualized education plan. And then, of course, the day program. And after yesterday's talk, I added on, but didn't, because my, I didn't have time, legal, because we need the legal part of the team. So now medications. There's, there are FDA approved meds, and then there are meds that are used off-label. So I'm going to first start talking about what's actually been approved by the FDA for treating various conditions. For the autism spectrum disorder, there are two meds. The, the antipsychotics, risperidone and aripiprazole. And these really, they're not curative, as we heard about before, but they can be tremendously helpful with individuals reducing the irritability, reducing the hyperactivity, helping the people be much more available to sit, focus, learn, take advantage of the speech, the OT, the special education services. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's to reduce, to help enable them to be, to be more, more available. And a lot of the problematic behaviors like the aggression, the hyperactivity, the self-injurious behavior, inflexibility, rigidity, pretty reliably those improve with the, with the antipsychotic medications. The ADHD meds, um, the, there are sort of two flavors of stimulants, the methylphenidate-based ones like, like Concerta, and then the dextroamphetamine-based ones like Adderall XR. Uh, um, and those, for most kids, are, are sort of the first line in, in treating the ADHD. Adamoxetine, Stratera, who are a little bit differently, uh, um, but all of those can pretty reliably improve attention span impulse control, frustration tolerance, the restlessness, hyperactivity, and again, with the goal of helping the person be more available to take advantage of the special ed and all the other specialists that are involved in their, in their care, improving the quality of life. Uh, um, the alpha-2 agonists like clonidine, guanfacine, uh, um, sometimes, particularly with the, with the younger kids that, that have a harder time with, with, with swallowing pills, in the past we had the clonidine patch, it's like a little band-aid you put on the back and switch it every week. Um, one of the most dramatic kids, probably the youngest kid I ever treated, a two and a half year old girl, looked severely autistic, just a complete whirling dervish. Gave her a clonidine patch, they say don't cut it, we cut it into a quarter, put it on, transformation, the girl was able to sit, she was able to work with a speech and language therapist. Five years later, she looked almost indistinguishable from other kids. So you treat the ADHD and you, you never know what you're gonna get, uh, and it can be really dramatic. Uh, depression, uh, the SSRIs now 25 years old, 30 years old, uh, and still pretty much the first line for, for treating depression. Uh, um, you recognize the name, you know, Flora, Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro. The SNRI is also real helpful. Um, the mirtazapine, I'll come back to that later, but that, um, and then trazodone, real good for sleep, uh, um, but kind of sedating for most people, for, uh, too sedating for, to take it as a primary antidepressant. Bupropion, Wellbutrin, uh, um, not one that you're gonna use in people who have a history of seizures, uh, um, but certainly an effective antidepressant med. For anxiety, we have the SSRIs again, the SNRIs, and then a, a few others sort of thrown in, the antipsychotic uh, catiapine or Seroquel, uh, um, Busprone, a real old medication, real good with generalized anxiety disorder, but not helpful with depression. And then the benzodiazepines, which you know, we try not to use those, but you know, every now and then you do find folks where they do make a difference and, and um, because of tolerance, you may ultimately need to periodically adjust the dose upward. So mood stabilizers, we talked a bit about, we heard about bipolar disorder. There are sort of three different categories of mood stabilizers that are used with bipolar disorder. The oldest is lithium, uh, kind of fell out of favor for, for a while as the anti-epileptics and the antipsychotics became more and more um, 
uh, in vogue. Uh, th that said, it, it certainly is experiencing a resurgence. For many people, it really is uh, the, kind of the gold standard uh, with really good mood stabilization as well as strong antidepressant effects. And with bipolar disorder, probably has the best literature behind it for, for preventing suicide. Uh, the the anti-epileptics, uh, valproic acid, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, real good, real clean, uh, um, real favorable side effect profile, uh, but uh, it takes two or three months to, to be effective. And so what often we'll do is stabilize with something else and then over time maybe transition over to, to lamotrigine. Uh, um, and certainly if people have, have epilepsy, really try to partner with neurology so that we're using one medication rather than two as much as possible. Uh, uh, the antipsychotics, you'll see some of the familiar names in there, the aripiprazole or abilify, risperidone, risperdal, you know, the, probably the two most commonly used. The newer ones, like uh, Latuda, metabolically cleaner, uh, um, much, uh, much less risk of the uh, hypercholesterolemia, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, diabetes, and much less risk of, of weight gain. So this is an area of modest progress with the development of new medications, um, but certainly not fabulous yet. Um, tick disorders, um, basically you've got the, the old antipsychotics, the pimazide and haloperidol, and again the, the second generation, risperidone, aripiprazole, and then those ADHD meds pop up again, clonidine and guanfacine. Uh, um, for, for aneurysis, old standby from even before the SSRIs, imipramine is one of the tricyclic antidepressants, and it's still used uh, for, for, for nocturnal aneurysis as well as encopresis, and then desmopressin, the synthetic DDAVP. Um, and now let's move into the off-label use. You know, we, we heard earlier today about how a large percentage of, of these medications are used without a pure psychiatric diagnosis. Why is that? Well, it's because people often don't fit neatly in a diagnostic category, or they may have a smattering of, of an anxiety disorder, some, some ASD, some ADHD, kind of a history, a family history of mood lability with the, with the um, with the, the first-line ADHD or SSRI meds, and so it gets messy. <laughs> so then it becomes a question of what works. And so with aggression and irritability, impulsivity, we might start with the ADHD medications. Someone who has more of a strong family history of bipolar disorder or a lot of mood lability, we may start with the antipsychotics. Uh, um, Someone where, where the impulsivity is not so much of an issue, but the aggression, irritability, the anti-epileptics or lithium, the beta blockers can be good with the impulse control, not so much with the, with the mood lability. And then prazosin, real interesting medication. Uh, it's an old antihypertensive medication. Uh, uh, works a little bit differently than clonidine and guanfacine. This is the one that uh, seems to be the most helpful in PTSD for suppressing nightmares, and uh, for during the day, also helping with, with um, intrusive thoughts, intrusive memories, and generally reducing the, the noradrenergic load. Uh, finally, amantadine, kind of an old medication used with, for, for the flu. Uh, um, th that has kind of a little bit of sort of weak ADHD kind of, uh, kind of benefits. Uh, um, and for people who can't tolerate a lot of the other things, it, it certainly can still be a, a go-to option. Um, other off-label use for self-injurious behaviors, the antipsychotics, the anti-epileptics, those blood pressure meds come back, come back again, and then naltrexone, which you probably read about you know, with the opiate crisis. Uh, naltrexone is the, the acute antidote for, uh, for people who overdose on the, on, um, on the opiates, and it does have some, some old uh, applications with self-injurious behaviors, and every now and then we still use it. Sleep. Huge, huge issue. Um, suffice it to say, we want people to get a good night's sleep, and we'll do anything that we can to, to facilitate that. Uh, pediatricians use a lot of clonidine. Uh, um, we also use trazodone, uh, uh, mirtazapine. The main difference between the trazodone and, and mirtazapine is that the mirtazapine 
also uh, tends to increase the appetite. So if you got a kid on a stimulant and they, their sleep is worse and their appetite is worse, mirtazapine is like a wonder drug. <laughs> and it's also good with anxiety and depression. Uh, um, and these are old, all of these are old, available generically. Gabapentin, uh, um, helpful both with sleep initiation and also if there is some degree of restless leg syndrome, the nocturnal restlessness, sweating, kicking, gabapentin often will, will take care of that. Antipsychotics by themselves, you're not going to use those for sleep, but if there are a number of these other issues that we talked about, again, real, real good, solid choice. Uh, um, Many of them pretty, pretty, are pretty sedating. And the non-prescription uh, options, you know, valerian, melatonin, GABA, uh, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, and increasingly we're hearing families using CBD, uh, um, which you know, for daytime anxiety, not a great choice because it's sort of like four to six hours or so duration and people develop a tolerance and need higher and higher doses throughout the, over multiple doses and higher doses over time. But periodically for sleep, you know, I've had enough parents say that, that that's what's worked, like fine. Uh, um, side effects, a lot of people are worried about side effects. Why? Well, because they're common. You know, probably a quarter of people develop some side effects, usually at the beginning. Uh, most of the time, they, they subside. And if they don't, the reality is that many of the side effects can be managed. Uh, um, sedation, insomnia, the, the increased appetite or weight gain, real commonly an issue with the, with the antipsychotic medications. Now, in the, the psychiatric literature over the last five years or so, pretty good evidence that, that things like metformin can be used both prophylactically to reduce the risk of diabetes, antipsychotic-induced diabetes, and also the metformin can reduce the weight gain associated with the, with the antipsychotics. And we're seeing that increasingly in clinical practice. The decreased appetite, mirtazapine <laughs> or an antipsychotic if you got it. The GI side effects, as we heard from Susan, you got to manage the side effects, the GI symptoms, uh, um, and once you do a lot of the behavioral issues, improve. The dry mouth, thank you, Alan, for teaching us about, uh, about the, the oral health. Uh, um, the, the, the baking soda that, that Alan mentioned, it's a, it's a real deal. It's a real deal. You know, he meant, talked about putting it in, in, in the half teaspoon of, so, of baking soda and water. You know, for many families, that's too complicated. You get a little dish in the bathroom, you get the toothpaste, just scoop up a little bit of dent, uh, baking soda, put it on the toothbrush, put the toothpaste on, boom. You get twice a day, you reduce the oral acidity, you reduce the risk of the, of the of cavities. Uh, um, so it's a manageable side effect. People are rarely going to volunteer, hey, I got dry mouth, dry mouth from this, or hey, I'm constipated from this. You got to ask. You got to ask. Uh, emotional flattening, if it's a little bit, you watch it for a week or two. In the long run, though, in my mind, this is just as bad as vomiting or diarrhea. If it persists, it takes away the, the person's the, the sparkle. We got to change the medications. Uh, Overall dropout rate, probably about 10% of the time you start something and side effects don't subside and you end up needing to move on to something else. Um, there's, there are some rare but serious, but serious side effects. With this population, what you're largely going to see is worse mood or worse behavior. Uh, um, the akathisia, particularly associated with the antipsychotic medications, it, it can be just an internal sense of restlessness, jitteriness, fidgetiness, or full on all the stuff that you're trying to treat of agitation, irritability, explosiveness. If, if it's really full on, big time akathisia, all of that stuff actually gets worse rather than better. It can occur right away. It can occur as much as a month after you've started the medication or done a dosage adjustment. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky as to how, where do you start dosing-wise and how quickly do you move up. Uh, um, but then pretty much any medication can cause agitation. That's where, you, as, you're, as you're starting something, you talk about what are the possible pluses and what are the possible minuses, what's the point when you call. Suicidal ideation. About 10 years ago, the FDA required all the antidepressants, the antiepileptics, and stratera, the atomoxetine for ADHD, 
all to carry the warning about suicidal ideation. It's real. It's about 1 to 2%. Um, if it's going to occur, it's generally in the first month or two, and, um, or after a dosage adjustment. And if it occurs, you stop it, and with the exception of like Prozac that has a really long half-life, usually within a couple days, the medication washes out and, and it subsides. Um, the, the people who seem to be at slightly higher risk for suicidal ideation from, from the meds are people with, with bipolar disorder or a family history of bipolar disorder or a history of a lot of mood liability beforehand or people where there, there's a history of abuse, trauma, neglect, sort of PTSD stuff. Uh, cardiovascular, you know, tend to, to, to try to check blood pressure, monitor blood pressure, heart rate. Uh, and then the tardive dyskinesia uh, um, with the antipsychotic medications. There are a couple new medications out to manage tardive dyskinesia. Uh, uh, when that develops, then it's obviously a, a, a tricky situation. You sort of decide whether the benefits outweigh the, the side effects and can, can train, change the medication, get off to, and then move to something else. So um, in talking about medications, we always want to talk with the person who's going to be taking the medication and enlisting them since it's their body. Would you be interested in trying something that can help you feel better, not get so angry, do better in school? And in my experience, probably about 95% of the time, people say, yeah, yeah. So then there's the discussion about, okay, Meds aren't going to do everything. This is part of the bigger treatment plan that's going to involve the behaviors, therapy, school, day program, the other medical and dental specialists. Let's keep it all in perspective. If we're lucky, we hit a home run and it's completely transformative. Every now and then you do hit that home run. More often than not, you get some benefit, but there's still work to be done. Um, how conservatively or how aggressively do we treat? You know, it depends a lot on the situation. You know, the, it, it, when somebody's placement in school or in a day program is in jeopardy or if people are getting hurt, then we're going to tend to be a little more aggressive with the dosing. If it's, okay, we've been living with this for a long time, we can afford to be a little more conservative, then we may go a little bit more slowly. Uh, um, when families are, are reluctant to, to treat, then there's the discussion about, well, what's the poten potential risk of treatment? What's the risk of not treating? And if you really decide not to treat, what's a reasonable time frame? A month, two months, three months? What's the time frame where we're going to agree to go back and revisit the question of medications? Personally, usually I'll give about three months as a, as a suggestion. Uh, um, and uh, the risk of going up too, fa too fast or too, too slow, again, like with, with the akathisia, uh, uh, if you overshoot, you're a little more likely to get the, the uh, um, medication-induced agitation. If you go too slow, it could take you three months to get anywhere, and that's, for many of these families, too long. Um, just finishing up discussing medications, just the logistics of who's given them, making sure that, the, particularly with the stimulants, that if there's any concern about anyone else in the house who might be diverting them, you might pick something like Stratera or Vyvanse um, if you're going to be treating ADHD. Uh, monitoring the response and side effects. We love getting the feedback from the school. Absolutely essential with, the, with kids to get that feedback, as well as from the parents, as well as from the day program with, with adults, uh, um, and of course from the individual. And then as far as adjusting the dose, everybody sort of has their own style. Uh, um, personally, I will usually start out saying, yeah, okay, we're going to start with this, and I expect that probably this is the range where we're going to get some benefit. Let's start low, and then, group, and then giving you permission to move up every week or two by such and such increments, and then once you get up to such and such a point, I want you to call me. Other docs, I really you know, prefer more of like, I want to see you in two weeks. You know, it's a little bit of a question of sort of what, what's, what's your availability and, and how comfortable you are in giving the family the, the leeway. 
Um, a lot of questions about it. generic, is it just as good as brand? The vast majority of the time, it's just as good. Uh, the bioavailability can vary by about 20%. If you're using a single medication, you end up using the dose a little bit higher or a little bit lower, and effectively it's the same. It's really more of an issue, the brand, if you're doing polypharmacy, particularly with anti-epileptic medications, and you have complex drug interactions where it may vary, um, the, the, the blood levels of the anti-epileptic medication, if you switch from one uh, provider, one generic to, to a different. Uh, Non-compliance, we talked about, Susan talked about that. Often when people stop meds or take it unreliably, there's some kind of side effect going on, so you want to ask about that. And then the follow-up, you know, the, the kind of standard of care is about every three months to, to have a check-in. Um, for many folks, that will include checking, you know, check vital signs and weight. Um, and then with the labs, particularly with the antipsychotics and several of the anti-epileptic medications and lithium, uh, about every six to 12 months uh, to, to do the, the routine lab work with that. Uh, polypharmacy, we try to avoid it, but particularly with individuals with complex medical and psychiatric needs, it's not unusual. Uh, um, in case of doubt, call a pharmacist. Pharmacists are, are also part of the team. Uh, um, there are other applications like Hippocrates that, that you, you can also use, uh, um, and they'll give you a ballpark indication of what kind of interactions you need to be concerned about. Pharmacogenomic testing. This is sort of like the 23andMe of psychopharmacology. Uh, um, GeneSight and GenoMind offer, uh, offer this kind of testing. It's just a swab from the, the cells inside your cheek. Uh, um, and it's particularly helpful at indicating, for, uh, for me, what I found is that people who have had multiple failed trials of medications, that's, that's when we might think about doing it. Uh, um, and it, essentially, it's going to tell you, are you genetically prone to be a rapid metabolizer of the medication, a slower metabolizer, in which case you're going to be more sensitive, or typical metabolizer of, of the medications. And they have a whole panel of different, different families of meds that they'll um, assess. And the good news is that both Medi-Cal as well as Medicare will now pay for the, the pharmacogenomic testing. Um, in conclusion, uh, psychiatric conditions are common in this population. Uh, one of the recent studies suggested that at least a third of people have some uh, comorbid psychiatric condition. Treatment involves a team, a whole person approach, and the medications can be a safe and effective part of a comprehensive treatment plan. And there are email addresses. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And thank you very much. <laughs>